The real development of NGOs, I think, has started somewhere in mid-90s in Georgia and was somehow connected to the entrance of uh, foreign um, embassies, foreign donors. However, it doesn't mean that the NGOs uh, were like, really facilitated or the existence was coming to uh, life. Just the opposite. New groups, new groups of active citizens really saw this opportunity, started to somehow come together. And I would say that those NGOs that started to be launched somewhere in mid-90s, many of them have survived up to now. And they very quickly developed in quite robust organizations from the, that time already uh, fighting for protection of human rights, monitoring elections. This was one of the first kind of tasks. Uh, uh, already participating in legislative drafting, including, for example, the Constitution on, of 1995. After that, I would say that the uh, NGO sector probably in Georgia had ups and downs. Um, uh, to, if we go by, by governments that we had in Georgia in the uh, Shevardnadze era, especially in the last years with weakening of the government and its complete like uh, corrupt uh, uh, performance, uh, I would say that at one point NGOs even looked like as an alternative to the government and alternative to the state which I don't know by itself whether it was a very good thing. Uh, and that's why probably somewhere in late 90s and early 2000 years, NGO sector really looked very strong, uh, looked very quite, I mean, qualified, experienced, and much better vis-a-vis -vis the government. Um, and it happened so that in our um, uh, Rose Revolution of 2003, the NGO leaders actually played a very important role. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, from what I remember and what we have seen, like uh, and, uh, especially in terms of revealing the uh, violations in the elections, actually being very active in the pre-election period, and then kind of mobilizing citizens to uh, uh, I mean, uh, to uh, request changes after these rigged elections. And maybe they also somehow contributed to this, this change to be peaceful. Um, uh, after that, uh, quite, quite a paradoxical thing happened, I would say, because lots of NGO leaders, uh, as they were so much seen on the scene, got invited to the uh, then government. Uh, and many of the really active leaders uh, left uh, uh, our sector, which by, by itself weakened a bit uh, the NGO society. But uh, the another paradox was that though the expectation, original expectation was that there would be like very active cooperation with the government kind uh, and like uh, active involvement in policy formulation, it did not really happen. Uh, I don't know, maybe because the government was in a rush, which was already mentioned uh, yesterday, or maybe they uh, didn't did expect so much those that were uh, remaining in the civil sector. No real cooperation has happened. Probably there was an original like honeymoon for half a year, and then uh, things uh, started to be different. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, the kind of networks of NGOs did uh, get some significant blow, but they started to somehow uh, re reinvent and regenerate. Uh, another strange thing is that uh, from what I see, like reinvigoration of the Georgian NGOs, it's actually after the war of 2008 with Russia. And I remember Mr. Fukuyama yesterday talking that sometimes wars, unfortunately, they cause the, I mean, uh, stronger nation building, they may probably also cause strengthening of the civil sector. At least that's what I think that has happened. Uh, first of all, through the days of the war itself, the NGOs turned out to be very ready to be involved in every day, like, humanitarian activities really on their own. And this was also the first time when we could see the citizens of Georgia being ready to volunteer, to volunteer, uh, yeah, maybe first time uh, in terms of not, not uh, expecting anything back, neither from donors, from, from NGOs, but just to volunteer and be involved in direct assistance to the refugees. 
uh, and it also showed uh, this potential, potential of volunteers, potential of being ready to sacrifice uh, the time and energy um, there to see the development. Um, Afterwards, if we um, go kind of through years or pe period, I do think, and some people may disagree, that uh, let's say in 2009 and 2010, um, the NGOs, and these were already coalitions of NGOs, played quite an important role during this standoff, and I mean the, the standoff between government and opposition, and real threats that it could be uh, degrading into chaos or into a civil unrest. Uh, uh, the, the NGOs which tried to come together were calling both sides to refrain from violence, to re uh, somehow, uh, I mean, uh, get into negotiations. And uh, of course, there were other developments as well which were important, but I think they did uh, contribute to the peaceful development in this period. And uh, finally, coming up to 2012, again, I think, I mean, uh, political parties tend to forget uh, that they always are happy with themselves, be it now opposition now or our government. But uh, I think the NGOs and the SNACs really contributed once again to the peaceful of change of power through elections, which Many of our citizens were so happy yesterday mentioning, like, <laughs> unfortunately, we had the first uh, this type of uh, change of power only in 2012, not before. So I do think that uh, uh, the Georgia civil sector has really contributed to this through, first of all, this, uh, I mean, quite vigorous campaigns, and probably many of you here remember this, it affects you too, which was calling on the one hand for improvement of electoral legislation, on the other hand for uh, large outreach to media, uh, to protection of citizens, uh, if they were somehow, I mean, politically abused. Mm, uh, now, uh, I would say, we went through another honeymoon with another government. Uh, but things are uh, changing once again. At least we can see some signs of the things changing. If um, uh, thinking about did uh, uh, the civil sector in the past two years manage to get through its agenda, I think uh, they did. Uh, for example, we can talk about local government legislation, which the major contributors were, again, the NGOs. We can talk about another big campaign we now, which asked to, for curbing the covered surveillance, which again was initiated by NGOs and not met with great pleasure by the now new government. Uh, however, it was successful. Uh, then we can speak about new media legislation. So I would say uh, the relations are never easy, neither with the government nor with opposition, but some successes can be achieved, especially when NGOs managed here to make coalitions. Unfortunately, we sometimes still need some international support, but the <laughs> I mean, uh, with the initiative growing from here and then gaining international support and support of international community, and some successes can be achieved. In terms of, uh, I don't know whether I have more time. Uh, of course, uh, we are not a very, uh, absolutely perfect uh, sector or space. Of course, there are lots of um, challenges that we are all experiencing. Uh, if I don't have any more time, maybe I'll stop here, but then wait for questions. I'm sure people will want to hear more about challenges. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm here. I'm, I'm a physics professor, so I was um, asked to give a couple of, uh, to say something about education, mm -hmm. uh, possible reforms. So the uh, the needs for uh, the education system are very basic at the moment. Uh, so what is needed is the implementation of uh, peer review process in the selection of professors. And uh, so professors must be selected through the international peer review process. And 
they must be given academic tenure. Otherwise, it's uh, impossible to protect academic freedom. And therefore, there is no academia without academic freedom. This is the uh, most urgent need for, for the reforms. Um, another thing is um, in the, the interaction between education and science, scientific research, uh, they are not separable. So therefore, universities and in general uh, institutions, uh, scientific institutions must be international research centers. So uh, there are several so there are several postulates and axioms, or whatever you want to call them. Uh, if you want to build a successful educational system, which are uh, which we cannot bypass, and, and one of these is that you need a world-class uh, cooperation uh, in research, scientific research, in-house. Now, this, of course, at the beginning, this cannot be in all the disciplines, but you cannot compromise quality. It has to be a world-class operation. Um, this is another urgent need uh, for the successful reform. So basically these are two pillars that uh, uh, are necessary for building uh, on top of this uh, a successful system of education and scientific research based on academic freedom and protected by academic tenure. Uh, the example, I can give you an example of the international uh, world-class operation. One example is uh, uh, conducted by, by my colleague here, and then Dr. Gorsi about the, 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 in general, about uh, study, anthropological studies, but in the context of bigger, in the bigger context, if you go into the museums, and there are a number of very important reforms that have been done there. It's, uh, it, it's very encouraging, but, but we need this type of operations in the other disciplines. This is extremely important. Uh, okay, basically I can stop here and then, I don't know, we can take questions. But these are the very basic things. Without implementing this, we cannot do anything successful in the educational system. Uh, it simply will not work. That's it. Um, hi. My name is Kiga Zatania. And uh, I'll start uh, at the point of the break up on the show too. Yeah? Uh, when um, Georgia was in a paradoxical situation, at that point, it was, uh, one could say, part of an industrialized country with developed scientific and education infrastructure, but you could not really say it was a modern country. And uh, it was not only about the backwardness of the institutional setup, which was at that point, but it was uh, also um, about the uh, cultural system of cultural values, which uh, basically at that point did not allow the um, creation of modern um, society. And um, one could say that during this last quarter of a century, in Georgia we have observed two parallel movements. The first movement was kind of the opening of the country, or let's say modernizing the country, perhaps in the social and cultural most liberalizing. And parallel to that, there was a backlash, uh, which led to the process, which I'm not, not having a better term, called retraditionalization of society. And by that, I mean not just going back to the traditions, but actually inventing the, uh, traditions which are sometimes very archaic, uh, values and practices uh, which uh, go, uh, don't go back to the decades, they should go back to the uh, centuries. So these two processes, um, at the, till today, go almost hand in hand. And I would argue that this process of retraditionalization draws its strength from the modernization impetus, so to say. And that's why it's very hard to stop one without stopping the other. And, uh, you know, uh, I would, one of the major signs for that, uh, I would see in the uh, unheard of revival of religion in this country. A revival of religiosity uh, was a quite um, natural reaction after the fall of the Soviet Union, 
in almost all the countries, but what happened and what is still happening in Georgia is still unprecedented if we compare it to the neighboring countries from the region like Armenia, Azerbaijan, Russia, etc. Uh, in Georgia, religiosity has reached um, unexpected heights, and one could say that one of the examples is the very high correlation between youth, the youth and religiosity. And normally one expects that the church is the place of the old people, but if you go to uh, Georgian churches, you will see that there are so many young people, it's very um, atypical um, for religious around the world. Actually, by social, by, um, social science surveys, it is confirmed that um, younger generation in many ways is more religious than the older. So this is also linked with this movement of ritualization I was talking about. Now, um, in this context, where do, do science and education come into play? I will uh, go a little bit philosophical and I will say that a risky statement that democracy implies a um, uh, priority of immanence. So basically, democratic society cannot be any, is never founded on the transcendent principle. Because citizens of a democratic country, which is a democratic society, should understand that their action matters. And that's why, uh, be it in ancient Greece or being in modern um, European developments, democracy always goes hand in hand with the diminishing sense of transcendence. And in a sense, science and education provide a, a framework for this um, uh, imminent understanding of uh, or self-understanding of society. Um, I think that, for example, if we, uh, I will give you two examples. Uh, first is the example of religious, um, uh, religious fundamentalism. Um, uh, let's start with the very uh, trivial one. Ten days ago, there was this um, festival of electronic music, um, which was um, uh, condemned by the religious circles, and. Parallel to that, because it's, because of its free wars and its free kind of, uh, um, we're not really deemed um, uh, morally acceptable um, by the by the religious circles. So what happened was that when a flood happened in the mountains, this uh, event of the festival was linked with this flood. Now it's absolutely trivial example. One could say that one could have the same, um, let's say, discourse in more developed societies. I will give you another example and then I'll address this question. Another example is a very widespread um, um, tendency of political conspiracy outcomes, or conspiratorial fantasies, or even um, kind of the paranoid style in Georgian politics. What I mean by that is that uh, basically there is a very deep, a very uh, deep entrenched um, feeling within the political system, but also outside of it, that things do not happen on the scene. Every, everything has kind of a background motive, which is um, occult, occult, so to say. Some decisions are, take, are taken somewhere else. But political parties don't consider their opponents as legitimate because these opponents represent some other interests always. And um, uh, this, this is also nothing new for a developed um, democratic society. One could argue that the parallel style is um, very widespread, uh, let's say, in the United States, US political system. But I think there is a very big difference. And this difference is that, first of all, for example, in the US context, we have a very well developed and institutionalized political system. And these discourses exist on the fringes of this and when they become, when they come closer to the center, then even the U.S. system experiences crisis. Whereas in Georgian context, we don't have this 
strong institutionalized political system, and these discourses and these movements, like religious uh, fundamentalism or uh, let's say political astrology, are, f are far closer to the center, and these uh, they uh, threaten this democratic self understanding of society. So I think that it is at that point that, for example, um, scientific or education, you know, institutions play a crucial role. I understand very well that um, uh, science is completely other functions, but in relation to democratic development, the function of science will be uh, providing the understanding to the citizens that their actions really matter, it's actually their action that matters, and education system should really transmit this um, knowledge, uh, knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge, let's say so, to the blind. Um, now, I would like to uh, say a couple of words about civil society because this also can be linked, as, I suppose, with these uh, questions. Um, you know, um, Katie has talked about it already. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, we all have the feeling, uh, both as the activists and the observer, observers, that in Georgia, civil society is not really, does not really correspond to the normative content of this content always, uh, in the sense that uh, civil society is supposed to be the articulation of the um, uh, interest of the, uh, let's say, um, the groups in, within society, whereas in Georgia, what the civil society does is to represent the values of international community. So I would say that also very bluntly that uh, if we expect civil society to be uh, the watchdog of democracy in Georgia, civil society is the watch, watchdog of liberalism, which is a great thing actually, very good thing. But it also always since, uh, since many years ago, since the last decade I suppose, also experiences this as a problem and uh, would like to change the situation, but it's almost uh, impossible because there is nobody which can change civil society of, you know, from uh, outside of it. But also, very paradoxical situation is that those groups who really represent the interests, articulate the interests, and who do not depend for, um, on the, uh, let's say, a fund of, uh, a funding of the foreign donors, they are those groups which are far closer to religious fundamentalism, a fundamentalist movement, and uh, they can be turned on civil society, not civil society, because civil society somehow implies plurality, whereas religious fundamentalist groups exclude the possibility of plurality. So, what can be said about this? I think this is also uh, one of the, uh, this of course, structural problem, but also the problem of uh, our understanding of civil society because we tend to somehow understand civil society as an actor, as an agent. Whereas I suppose it's more like a scene or a sphere, and especially in relation to these uh, topics of science and education, I would see like a very important dimension. It's a public sphere where you can uh, bring forth the argument, arguments, um, and these uh, arguments, the force, force of these arguments are the most important thing, not the, uh, let's say, status or um, really viol violence to which an institution or group of persons can re um, have resort to, etc. So I think that what at this point uh, in Georgian societies uh, groping or let's say looking after a city is more like the public sphere in which this um, forceless force of the argument could be institutionalized. And I suppose that at, at this uh, we have some progress, especially um, perhaps after appearance of this online media, etc., which have really transformed um, uh, society discussions quite radically. So I think that uh, this would be kind of the short outline of how, uh, how uh, these uh, three topics can be linked to the development of the democratic society. And then uh, if there will be questions, I will have to ask. Hello, my name is uh, Leonie Gideishvili. I'm a philologist, classical classical philologist and medieval studies manager. So today I'll speak uh, about uh, humanities as an uh, important uh, sphere for civic society, society of citizens. 
as was mentioned yesterday several times, democracy is an ongoing effort to keep it, to stand in front of a difficult reality and leave this difficulty, face complexity, take risks, make responsible uh, steps, live freedom. Freedom is not carefreeness or carelessness, but an ongoing intellectual effort of identifying different choices and making conscious and conscientious decisions. Now, such an attitude requires a specific state of mind, a specific modus of life that is not given, but elaborated and cultivated through education. I mean here primarily humanitarian education. Humanities deal with formation of a mindset that posits most important and fundamental questions, of questions to reality and life. Rather than, uh, rather than seeking to say Max Frisch, uh, to utilize Max, Max Frisch uh, saying, pursuit of level of life. The humanities uh, make us think about the meaning of life, the, what is sense of life. So it's questions about human destiny and human value, ultimate questions about it. That's what humanity is all about. Only through rapping with those questions is for human conscience. Conscience does not grow like a bear. It is elaborated through education. It's, a, it's formed in a thinking process. All that has bearing on healthy civil society, or better, society of citizens, unless human value is discovered and cultivated, other values will take its place. According to logic, that holy place is never empty. So uh, it's impossible to, because it's impossible to live values like we live values. Thus, without a certain neck towards solitude and thinking about the meaning of life, self-reflection and critical investigation of the ideas coming and going in us. Human is doomed to follow different inertia of passions or ideological schemes that make cement those passions. About solitude, I like very much this uh, verse by William Butler Yeats. He says this phrase, how can they know truth flourishes where the student's lamp has shone and they alone that have no solitude? Now, democracy and society of citizens requires a critical mass of such responsible and conscientious people who dare to think for themselves, make decisions for themselves, and communicate to others whatever they discover. Unless such people are formed, we can have different forms of autocracies and even tyrannies, now already in guise or under mask of democracy. Previous Soviet educational system as a whole was thoroughly ideological. Even sport. For instance, I was a tennis player in my adolescent years, and I had a tennis textbook, a Soviet tennis textbook, and on the practice it was written that the aim of a Soviet co coach is to rise a good communist citizen. So not win the champion which I wanted, but a good sort of communist citizen. Of course, there were wonderful and thought-provoking teachers, but they were at odds with the system, and they were such as their personal initiative or inspiration. However, usually the system consisted of the principle of, to use this Soviet movie, uh, let's, live to the, let's live up to the Monday, like principle of two Fs, find out and flatter. So uh, in Russian it's ugadat ugadit. So you should find out what is desirable for teacher or, or system, and you, then you have to flatter it. So as if there existed already a ready-made structure of work, and all you need is to conform to it. In principle, democratic civil society denies such a ready-made structure, structure of wealth. However, without the formation of a specific character through education, democratic procedure, pro uh, procedure of democracy, like formal procedure of democracy per se, will await for nothing. We have get again, we, we will get again people lazy to, to, to form their own ideas, their own structures of wealth, and people who are ready to follow us, infantilism, a dangerous infantilism. What we have now, in, also in present-day Georgia, is still a deep and devastating legacy of this infantilism, wounds of non-realized life and falling out of history. If we look at the history of the newly independent Georgia, we find amply the examples of those wounds. Coming out of the Soviet ideological scheme, many Georgians were prone not to change the attitude and get rid of such ready-made schemes, but just to substitute them with another, with another scheme, like nationalistic or religious. Again, 
especially the reform the first president in this national chauvinistic ideological scheme is also religious aggression. Aggression accompanies all those schemes. And what they all have in common is a dramatic and dangerous simplification of difficult realities. And reality is always difficult. Unformed conscience is a dangerous and aggressive conscience. Thus, democracy building is impossible without conscience formation, without formation of human value, which has infinite dimension. It's a, a word from uh, Apostle Paul. Hell, it's he, like, uh, invokes. Have conscience in Holy Spirit, says Paul. Even if one is not a Christian and does not believe in like ontological existence of Holy Spirit, it, it's, uh, so one can still understand the meaning of this word. A humble attitude that reverse, reverse infinity, infinitely vast, nuanced and difficult reality. Like in the blessed trepidation of Socrates, I know that I know nothing. And in investigation of this infinity, one's conscience can grow. All democracy building without understanding of this infinite human value is doomed to failure. Patriotism, and today and yesterday we spoke a lot about patriotism. Yeah? Patriotism that forgets more basic human dimension degrades this into chauvinistic ideology. Strong state building without taking heed and respecting the infinite significance of human being is doomed to failure. The great books of humanity deal exactly with those crucial issues and absorbing them, discussing them, forming one's character and value system through so rubbing with those fundamental ideas is indispensable for a character formation of a citizen of a viable democratic society. I think exactly forgetfulness of this basic, of the, of this basic, uh, basic thing led to failure of the Rose Revolution regime also. The principle, first strong state and then democracy, or first modernization, like crush modernization, and then human rights was pregnant with a humanitarian catastrophe. Again, a certain ideological scheme was born. Georgia is going towards its bright European future. And the vanguard of this course, the UNM, is clad with a certain mystical holiness. In such a way that even its violation of human rights, human dignity can be disregarded. What if also, what if also law and constitution is violated or tailored according to the desires of the ruling party? What if elections are rigged? It's nothing, still the holy one does those violations. Again, the same pitfall appears. The aim justifies means. And brighter the aim, more justifiable the means. To speak about the youngsters, we witnessed instances of ideological brainwashing in patriotic camps. Just to remind Salome Judge's famous uh, documentary with this uh, telling name, leader is always right. So in such, uh, in such camps, uh, there were such uh, theatrical shows shown. For instance, a Russian soldier stand there with a whip and whipping and personified Abkhazia in a beautiful woman. And then Georgian soldier comes and kicks out this Russian soldier and Abkhazia embraces Georgian soldier. This is a brainwashing of children because as if only problem of Georgians and Abkhazians is Russia. But it is lie, blood and lie. We have done many bad things to Abkhazians. That, that's why they uh, hate us. The first president was saying that Abkhazian nation doesn't exist. And he was also saying about Ossetians in an official interview as a president. Um, I mean, President Gamsakurde, as an official interview, he was saying that uh, Ossetians are savage and uh, uneducated uh, nation. So we have done many wrong things to make us hate us. And it's no, not only Russian and it's uh, civil services. So um, the teenagers were, co it, it was like, uh, also there was state-initiated uh, state initiated action that uh, forced, uh, I mean, incited uh, second graders to paint uh, drawings, uh, Russian Georgian war from my eyes. It was, again, the children who dra draw this painting, when they will read after that Chekhov or Tolstoy in their life? I don't know, maybe, maybe never. Yes. Also, like teenagers uh, were caught with marijuana and intimidated and demanded to mobilize UNM support groups in their neighborhoods in exchange not to be put to prison. Students were given money for summer works, but in reality were asked just to participate in UNM support meetings in special uniform. All those things were happening with the youngsters most fragile and receptive souls. What was the aim 
that justified such action? How can one valorize or linealize the state interest to such an extent over about a personal dimension? How can intimidated and frightened and brainwashed people join either NATO or EU? The great books, the great literature teach that person, a human being, is infinitely more important than state interest. State is for human being and not vice versa. In the great literature, we read about Achilles putting his personal dignity unjustly offended by Agamemnon about Greeks' success in Trojan War. We read about Antigone not obeying the laws of King Creo. Plato, who speaks about justice in terms of health of soul that only accounts for good political society also. We read the Gospel of Matthew, which puts grand rhetorical question what profit is if one gains the entire world but damages one's soul. We read Dostoevsky's hymn to human freedom and dignity in his legend of Grand Inquisitor. Those and many others are the texts that are indispensable for building good characters, without whom no healthy democracy can exist. Without such in-depth thinking about human destiny, dignity and value, we are doomed to ever repeating Komsomol type characters. Neo Komsomol, the young Communist Party guys, yes? Yet, now, now instead of marxist leninist slogans, they have fashionable slogans of freedom and democracy, but in the same fashion and even with the same voice, which is easily recognizable. In a Komsomol way, that is to say in a shallow way, without penetrating the meaning, without their thought going further than slogans. How frightening to watch them, listen to them, and how boring. How the, now, there is no receipt to overcome the Komsomol. It cannot be eradicated by external power. The only way is a qualitative humanities education at schools and universities. Reading and freely discussing great texts, provoking thoughts, and forming characters of students in a mysterious process of learning. Perhaps for that reason, any state, if it wants to make a long investment in democratic development, should first of all invest into education, and most importantly, humanities education, both at school and university levels. At least according to Plato's Republic, the most important among ministers is the Minister of Education. It seems it's good to be last. Science education could be part of nation building and particularly value-based identity building. And if you will ask anybody on the street, everyone will answer the most important thing is science. Not science, they will say education. But how to make it happen, this is the question. And I think we should speak and look further how we could achieve that education and science is positioned in society as a very high level. And people on the street will understand that it's not privilege of one elite group because very often science is considered as a privilege of one pontificating group, which are some club like Academia, Academy of Science or like this. And uh, I'm sure there is no other remedy having to develop education without having science. And I agree with my friend Guy Duale that you should have high quality of science, let's say high end of science. And to get high end of science, Georgia has chance. I probably convinced on it. But when we are talking about development of education and role of education in uh, society, we're using two elements. We are mostly talking of government or state talks about school system and university system. But there are other parts of this chain. This is a high end, which is a high level science, without its impossible education, as well as public education, which is grassroots part. And I would say that this part is maybe most important today to develop science education, public education. And I would add, uh, not just team, science, technology, and mathematics, I will synergize it with art. And in our case, in Georgia, in small country, country with really rich heritage, and it's not just uh, slogans which I'm saying. Georgian heritage has uh, 
international importance for research. And this synergy could be very strongly used as a tool, as a tool to develop society. I agree with many, many points you mentioned about problems, but I don't think we should complain about problems. We should find solutions. And uh, I would say best antidote for the all fundamental issues are public education and finding balance. And to do it, we need institutions. And to create institutions in a transitional democratic country, it's not easy, particularly cultural institutions. It's very rare, I would say. And I'm happy to say Georgian government was in, <coughs> has the courage to start it. I would say, I could say on the example of institution which I'm leading, Georgian National Museum, it's uh, not just museum, which we all knew, the dusty place, you know. This is an institution which has a role to be very active, first of all, in public outreach. I would say number one issue in our case, besides, of course, create high end of the science, and I agree with Gia, there could not be any compromise when we call it real science, is this development of this <coughs> outreach of science and knowledge and of course art. All this synergy could create, create creativity and imagination. And when we are talking role of humanities, I completely agree, but success could be if humanities could be synergized with natural sciences. And it's not me who said it, it starts from Leonardo, right? So all big successful cases were synergy between art and science. So what my point is, we tr should try to use and not to, to think that it's wasting of time to s spread values with cases. And I think these uh, cultural institutions, it will be either museum, either it will be theater or cinema, should be multifunctional. If they are multifunctional and we have opportunities to spread really from real grassroots, from the beginning, of the, what are the knowledge and values. I think this will be best solution. Because you know, if we will complain all the time that how strong is fundamentalist, we're orthodox country, it's a reality. We should learn to respect faith, but same time put knowledge. And I think uh, the, I could say one small example, which we work together, I am very happy to say that many people were participating in different governments to create Museum in Svaneti, in Mestia, which we will finalize this October. And you will see this is a final case of strong cultural educational institution, institute outside of Tbilisi with the role of the bring people together and to show respect to faith, but same time bring knowledge. Science and religious should be together in our case. We should learn it. If we will not learn it, then fundamentalists will win. So this is my point, very simple point. Science belongs not just for scientists. And all we had, we often have a, a great cases of individuals, fantastic cases. We have many islands, we have fantastic isolated scientists, but we have not yet courage to create system of public education. This is number one. And we, it's not below, it's a problem not on just scientists, it's a general problem. And if we will unify our energy towards it, it's very strong tool. Same I would say when we are talking about integration international world. Cultural heritage and study of cultural heritage of Georgia and generally Caucasus is an opportunity to bring international science here, international high schools, and even these small field schools or summer schools are the opportunity to us to be part of international science. And science has no border. And if we could be integrated, even from archaeology, which is changing position, archaeology was very colonial science in former time. Now it's no more. It, uh, local countries have a much more and more opportunities to use archaeology to develop own science and integrate exactly humanities and natural sciences. And I would say that this is a chance. Georgia has rich cultural heritage, which is same time big archive of knowledge. This is big infrastructure for research 
education and spreading values. So this is all what I wanted to say. I'm happy we have not oil. It's better to have heritage and develop your own heritage and to have really strong downstream towards using this for public outreach. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to thank the speakers. I'm having a little trouble getting my mind around the different threads that the, the five speakers have uh, 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 presented here. Um, I would point out to the rector that we're actually, Eric Jensen and I are gonna be at uh, your university at five o'clock this afternoon and we're actually gonna be addressing many of the topics that you mentioned. And I in particular, I'm gonna talk about this, the question of uh, uh, religion and civil society and I think um, Dr. Jensen will also uh, uh, weigh in on this, so there'll be another opportunity. On the question of education, I'm very sympathetic to all of these debates, although it does seem to me we've heard some very different emphases, and I'm not sure that I hear consensus really about what, what the agenda, uh, especially for, for um, Georgia is, because you can pursue hard science, you can pursue uh, a liberal education uh, and humanities, you can pursue um, you know, a more culturally specific uh, agenda, uh, but those are, you know, they're different and, and uh, there are very few societies that manage to do all of them <coughs> simultaneously um, uh, well. So I think we've got a lot of choices uh, you know, that have been put, uh, put in front of us. So uh, I'm not gonna express my opinion on that. Uh, I'm gonna throw, the, uh, throw it open to uh, comments from the floor. Yes, uh, this lady in the front. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much to the very interesting panel. And I have actually three questions. The first question is to Ms. Katie Hotsishvili. Um, up to now, the major donor for any civic activities were the international organizations. So it's, it's somehow the trend to believe that we do not generate our own agenda. However, the own agenda exists. But we have to respond more or less to that what the international organizations are, how to say, funding. So my question, and it's not about that it's good or bad, because I can for certainly say that about the gender equality, if not the international donors, there won't be anything. And I strongly support that. So my question is very simple. How do you think that there is a quite a coalition of the powerful NGOs? Do you have on the agenda to develop spatial policy to make our own people somehow to think about and generate the funds that will be used for the, uh, let's say, civil development. So this, another question is to all distinguished uh, panelists, and it's about the education and development. We want or not, we are the developing country, and there is a lot of, let's say, indicators that are debatable in developmental studies. However, the one of them, education, is not questioned. So my question is, uh, so I will make the small comment. Yesterday, the last panel were the economists discussing uh, two issues. First of all, about the qualified labor force that our education is not preparing at all, either on the vocational level or the higher education level. So Bank of Georgia is one good example. They created their own institute to train the qualified staff in the finance business. So my question is, how do you consider what are the main challenges of the education or reforming the education system in a way just to support development and build the modern society? And the third comment or question, thank you very much, Professor Giginashvili. You put absolutely right accent that without the critical thinking citizens, we won't build any democracy. My question is very simple. It's quite an expensive, let's say, endower 
How do you think we can change or modify the existing higher education system just to somehow respond to that goal? Thank you. So I, I forgot to introduce myself, but I think that it's okay. It was quite a few questions. Maybe why don't we respond to that uh, before we go on? Uh, uh, thank you, Marina. Actually, when I mentioned I didn't have time to talk about challenges, of course, one of the major challenges, which now, uh, once again, in a narrow uh, sense, the civil society, which I mean now the NGO sector is experiencing, is uh, dependence still, after 20 years, dependence on the foreign funding. And I would not say that uh, the agenda is always uh, completely defined by the donors because very often now the NGOs themselves are proposing the agenda. However, I mean, of course, there is this kind of donor-driven activities as well. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, pretty well understood by NGOs, and there are attempts now to somehow facilitate local philanthropy. It does not move easily. There is now a coalition of NGOs uh, led by TASO, which we probably know, the, uh, the Fund for Women, who have developed already their uh, piece of legislation. They have already submitted it to the parliament, and this, there is this process of advocacy. Of course, the legislation is never enough. We need our local businesses to start to understand the values of civil society. I mean, I wouldn't say that local businesses are all not involved at all in philanthropy, but I would say it's more charity than philanthropy. So this move to come somehow kind of push them from direct charity towards philanthropy and better understanding the, the value of the civil society. Uh, I hope this will be happening in the upcoming one or two years. Uh, in addition, I mean, the problem of uh, current NGOs still is a membership base, so they really don't have funding coming from their members. Uh, they also still have problem in terms of volunteering and better outreach towards public, because public could also contribute by, by, by their volunteering. So there are a number of challenges. I think there is understanding of these challenges in the civil society in terms of solving all these issues. It's, uh, it may still need, need time, but I hope this will ha be happening sooner than later. Did I answer your question? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm not sure which, which part of the question I should really address, but uh, okay, you asked about, if I understood correctly, that it's an expensive enterprise, and uh, so how to reform educational system to be, and uh, you know my opinion about this. I mean, if, if you want to build a car, you have, you, car must have wheels. You cannot build a car without wheels, it's impossible. So to build a uh, universe, successful university system without peer review process and academic tenure is impossible. It will not work, and that's what we are witnessing. So it's as simple as that. I mean, all this philanthropy and money and, and, and donors and this kind of stuff is extremely nice, but if you don't have a system that works, it will not work. Okay? It will be a waste of money and a waste of time. So this is, the, to me, it's a very simple approach. First, you need some basic rules. There are axioms that you cannot bypass. You cannot have university system, because in most important people in university are professors and students. You need high quality professors. So you need to attract high quality professors by international peer review process, and you must protect their academic freedom. And uh, academic tenure is the main thing in protecting uh, academic freedom. Without this, it will not work. You will not attract good professors, and they will not be protected. If they come, the, of course there will be exceptions. I mean, you may, once in a while, you may attract somebody high quality, but they will not be protected, and uh, to protect academic freedom is crucial. So that's my answer. Okay, so um, as for the funding, as we know, during the last couple of years, Georgia has been spending on education less than, for example, neighboring countries. So there is definitely a kind of um, possibility to, um, from, from the side of the state, to put more money into education than it has been done. It, it has been doing up to now, this is one thing. Second, I would address the question, I mean, this is also somehow linked with this retraditionalization process I was talking about, because I think that from the uh, 
um, from the country which has the, one of the highest literacy in the world, at least officially, I can't really just uh, prove, um, I check it, but right now we are going back um, even on the level of basic literacy. So this question has to be addressed and it can be addressed only on the level of schools. And before this is done, um, we actually would not, uh, don't have any other choice b b before we reach the point when the, uh, we, uh, when um, uh, young generation gets the basic uh, skills of, let's say, critical thinking or information um, um, so, uh, seeking or something uh, 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 in school, then there is no choice but to introduce the elements of liberal education at the university level so that one can basically uh, either begin just uh, catch up with the basic, with the deficiencies the um, this, uh, the new f freshmen have. So that's what you know, we did at our university. Any student coming to our university, whatever the field, will start with reading Plato. And I think. Um, it's not, it's not a luxury at our point, it's just a necessity, a basic necessity, because they don't only learn Plato at the law, they learn how to discuss things, how to write, uh, sometimes with many mistakes, etc. So I think before this system, starting with the school level is not really set, we don't have any choice but to introduce very strongly the elements of liberal education, that will be my answer. I'll answer, my, I'll answer my Marina's question. Yes, it's uh, very difficult because it's quite costly to make, uh, and to create a good critical reasoning provoking milieu. Like uh, I'm teaching at a high school, but it's very specific high school. It's an elite high school. It's called American Academy. Uh, oh, actually, initially it was financed and opened by a donation of um, Department of State. And all teachers were sent to Harvard and other American universities to return and uh, teach. And, but it's very specific. And we, we are uh, like doing the classes only with 14 students. And they have to read uh, some texts at home and then we discuss all the time. Initially, they come from ordinary schools and usually look at the as a, as a teacher. So we discuss, but what is the true answer? And they sometimes initially are bewildered to know that teacher does not have a ready-made answer, and its answer is not like a stone in your pocket to show them. And then, throughout the year, freshmen, they get accustomed to this system, and when they are seniors, already they cannot do otherwise. So it's kind of habit. But this habit is developed on this uh, specific uh, milieu of this school. Of course, we do some outreach projects, let's say, and um, even now creating some website, but it's not enough, of course. And the uh, uh, salaries of teachers should be increased because the good people are not going to school, or gifted people are not going to educational system because salaries are low. Also, um, also teachers should, be, like, uh, should have some sense of critical reasoning. Unless teacher himself or herself has this sense of critical reasoning, it's impossible to somehow <laughs> inject it uh, uh, in students. Let's say when you are reading some text, say, um, it's famous text, all children in Georgia re uh, read this, Martyrdom of St. Shushanik, first, uh, uh, text available in Georgia, yes? Usually it says uh, you should praise Shushanik in your composition and everything, but there are so many problematic issues there. For instance, Shushanik abandoning her children because of religion. Now, if you read it in today's newspaper that mother abandoned her children because uh, the children were, uh, started to read Buddhist literature, let's say, what would you think? So this kind of question should be ri raised. Or some, uh, some uh, old text which uh, you show to the student and say, take only one page of this text and just reconstruct the history out of the information that leaks through this one page, as if you discovered this one page in some way in ruins. And then with all these kind of exercises, teachers somehow infect also students with this critical uh, reasoning. It's not easy, it's kind of ongoing process. Also at university, I, um, like, uh, yeah, Giga knows that uh, it's, uh, we re read Plato, of course, but initially, sometimes they simply read and uh, respond by heart. But it's not to by heart. You, you ask that, not, don't tell me by heart what you have read, but why it was interesting, especially for you. Tell those your own existential points. Why this text hooked your interest, if it hooked, hooked it. So this is very difficult. And of course, uh, first of all, it's uh, salaries. Uh, salaries of teachers should be increased and salaries of professors should be increased that they may keep to academic, this uh, field. I don't know, I'm not expert in military studies or economics, but 
I don't, I don't think um, I don't think Georgia needs uh, uh, army to oppose Russia or Turkey because even if we send all our budget to, to, to this, we cannot at, uh, oppose Russia or Turkey. And with Armenia and Azerbaijan, we should keep uh, like a uh, friendly relationship. Why should we fight with them? But uh, and maybe this amount of money from military can go to education. I don't know. It's my suggestion, but I'm not expert. Sorry, it's a difficult co question. Sorry. Okay, so I saw one, two, three. So let's go in that order. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's my last, last intervention. I'm abusing my power. I know. I have two questions to Mr. Gignesh, and one short one to, to David Lord Kwenze. Uh, I was listening to the horrible stories you told about the education system abused before. I'm not going to argue with that. Obviously, I disagree, and I think most of the facts are either false or falsely interpreted, but that's not the issue. I haven't heard uh, any of your use, uh, Mr. Gignishvili, about the current situation, last two years, because that period is over. Why, why not? And in particular, I'm interested in the problem of the penetration of the secular system by fundamentalistic ideas in the, in the secondary schools. I mean, you haven't mentioned anything about that. You don't consider that a problem at all? Because if we take a look at the latest years, unlike beginning of the 90s, post-Rose Revolution, we had no violence, upheavals against ethnic groups. No anti-Russian pogroms, no problem. Despite the war, no anti-Ossession pogrom, nothing like that. Post-Rose Revolution, the violence against min minorities, even those who, which still existed, religious ones, subsided. Yeah? And we have an upsurge during the last two years, and we all know the ideology behind it is coming from the church. And it's an ideology of hatred and exclusion. So on one hand, we had no problem in practice, despite the horrible stories you told. On the contrary, we had progress and you seem to not mention elephant in the room. And to David on the same topic, you mentioned about respecting the face in this context. I'm really interested what you actually mean because uh, the dispute here is about <laughs> ideology of hatred, no, anti-secularism, no, and medieval thinking of not no. considering a human being a human being if he's representing sexual minorities. That's the dispute in our society. That's where the uh, fight is going on. Nobody is rejecting the right of respect of face to Orthodox Christians in Georgia. This is a non-existent problem. This is an excuse to justify violence against minorities. So uh, I elaborate, I, please. Yeah, I think it was not, uh, it was not so clear what I mentioned. This was when I mentioned Swanetti That's Museum. Swanetti. Some people here, I think Nika knows, it was not easy to convince this problem how to settle religious object. And when you showed very clearly that you are, have respect of it, I mean professional respect, I mean. I mean that when they are all well handled, well restored, well presented, this was my point. That where you should find, because there were some people opposing it, so we showed professionally that we have respect, but we are professionally <coughs> strong enough to keep it on the right way. This was my point. And concerning values and what you mentioned medieval, I don't think anybody in this room uh, supports ideas to stay in medieval time. I simply more <coughs> presented that in our goal and institutions like national institution is to spread values, knowledge, and to find these antidotes against it. This was my point. So. so uh, you, you said that we, we, there is an elephant in the room and we, we are trying not to notice it, but uh, actually no, this is... No, no, but no, but it's very, very, this, uh, the, uh, your question is very, very good, actually. The, I, I thank you for this question because the, uh, sometimes the elephant is not really visible. This is what I was trying to address also in my uh, comment, because when there is a problem in the top of the education system, university, the problem propagates down. And all these issues that appear down somewhere are, to me, are the result of this. So the elephant for me is precisely the elite education system, which is in a severe trouble. And unless we fix it, I don't think this fixing uh, bottom will, will work. That's, that's my point. So precisely I was trying to address the elephant in the room, and I fully agree with David. He's also trying to address elephant in the room in, from the different angle. But uh, yeah, that's a very good question, actually, yes. I think this uh, question of um, religious um, uh, fundamentalism, I, I t told in my presentation that 
Uh, when um, uh, communism collapsed and uh, so Georgia became an uh, independent country, uh, somehow in Weltanschauung, it, uh, like in a um, world, world view formation, it did not become you know, in, uh, democratic because they tried to find some, again, some ready-made schemes, either nationalistic or religious. And uh, we remember that um, in the 90s there were pogroms of uh, um, religious minorities, uh, this uh, Jehovah Witnesses or... I don't know, I, I said last year maybe also, but I, 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 don't, I, don't, I never heard about last year, but uh, I, I, heard, I heard this year, I heard of this, uh, uh, last year you mean uh, sexual minorities, not re religious, I, 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 I heard about this year when uh, um, parents, uh, Orthodox Parents Union went to Hanukkah, yes? Hanukkah, yeah. Okay, I'm speaking about uh, what, what I clearly know that Hanukkah, um, Hanukkah was uh, organized, Hanukkah celebration, and this, uh, there are radical Orthodox groups, yes. These radical Orthodox groups were in the 90s, they are also now, and uh, we have to fight against it, cope, somehow cope with it. If we, we have to, of course, uh, uh, use a very strong uh, fist of law against all these uh, all these violations, but uh, it's more important to how to say to address it intellectually, to speak with them about Christianity in critical reasoning terms. Because Orthodox Christianity, if you if you look at its core, at its core, it cannot be non-critical because it is based on church councils, and church councils are the instances and milieu of very deep critical thinking for m several months over very minute details of biblical texts. And there were very critical free discussions several months. Now we have uh, scientific conferences dedicating several issues and one issue discussed by two scholars, let's say, and like few questions. But at that time, one issue, one theological issue was discussed several months by great uh, luminaries of uh, thought. I mean, uh, let me let me finish. Let me finish. It, uh, last total council. It, it, just just a moment. When there cannot be orthodox council, but thought theological thought develops, and it develops ongoingly. And the great luminaries of uh, theological thought in Latin West, in Catholic Church, or in Orthodox Church, or in Protestant Church, it's ongoing development. And all these people who who I would say think that they go to liturgy. Re, uh, listen this gospel in very ancient language which they don't understand, absorb some kind of uh, feeling. They think that they are good Christians. But you should think about, uh, speak to them. Do you really understand this text? Do you really understand this old Georgian? Do you know the church history? Do you know this? And you should introduce this in a native way for them, this critical reasoning. And not to say that you are dark, you are nothing, but just to show them that it is in your tradition, the critical reasoning. And it's, uh, that's very important, not to lose these people. Because as Apostle Paul says that those Jews who did not uh, receive Christ, they're good people. They have ardency, they have this uh, zeal. And this zeal is good, but they don't have this zeal according to intellect, he said. So maybe these people, many of those people are good people in their zeal through something good, but they don't know what is really good. And you have to explain it through the, their very native church history. And it's possible. I have spoken with many of such, not many, but few of such, and they're, they're uh, listening, if you know church history very well. And I, uh, somehow it happened that I know it very well because I studied it five years in Budapest. So I, I think that, that's important to introduce critical reasoning in church. For instance, I give all the time this example to my students. You say that St. John Chrysostom is buried in, buried in Komana in Abkhazia, okay. And uh, the Greeks say that St. John Chrysostom is buried in Komana in Asia Minor. Now, you say that we are correct because Georgian holy church is holy tradition. But you can put a question. Greek church tradition also is similarly holy tradition. Then you take, erase this dimension of holy from this discourse. And what remains? Remains textual study, remains going to library, historical uh, sources and everything. You are, you are doomed to critical reason, yes? 
With all this exercise, with all this discourse, you are introducing this critical reasoning within these minds which seem to be impenetrable. And that's very important, not to lose these people. Yes, there are results, of course. Yeah, but not, not, of course, it's, it's, it's so difficult. You don't have ready-made results. And sometimes these results are not immediate. They may somehow sprout in the long run, in the time to pass. But it is a thing to be done, and not to exorcise those people as uh, some uh, demons. Of course, they, they are doing big violences. And I, I remember once uh, when there was this, uh, uh, when they cracked down this, uh, uh, anti-homophobic uh, meeting in uh, last year. I, I, I want, uh, in TV I said that I'm ready to talk with all those guys to say that Christianity cannot be this uh, chair uh, hitting on a bus or something. And, and then one priest called me and uh, I want to meet you. And we spoke. Of course we didn't agree about um, uh, some things, um, about some basic things. He said that, uh, oh, I, I, if my conscience says that I can uh, uh, defend it, I can't even violate police. I said, no, here you stop. You don't violate police. Even in Bible it is written, Paul says, P Apostle Paul says, Apostle P Peter says that you should, should obey civil authorities. And at that, that time it was even pagan civil authorities. So here, but we spoke at least, yes? And he sa had my ideas. So it's important to speak. But uh, so uh, I think that's, that's, a, that's a point that uh, critical reasoning should be introduced with a big doses in Orthodox Church, and not to say that Orthodox Church is dark, and those people are dark. That's my question, my answer. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're, um, we're uh, getting, uh, uh, getting towards lunch, so there's a question here and a question in the front, so let's take both of these uh, before uh, the panel answers. Actually, my question was partly answered by Mr. Zedania, but when I raised my hand, he hadn't spoken, so, but I'll, I'll repeat it again. We're talking about uh, improving university level education, but uh, how could that be done? How could that kind of reform be successful without reforming school system? And there was talking about uh, critical reasoning, uh, other skills that uh, ch children, school children should have, and those, uh, uh, you know, disciplines are not introduced within our school system. There is no research skills taught, there are no discussion, and maybe in some, uh, you know, experimental schools, some elite schools, as uh, one of your panelists said, but on general level, in, uh, especially in the regions, nothing like that happens. And uh, when uh, there was talking about quality professors, how could the quality professor change anything when uh, we, we don't have quality students, I mean, at, at, the, at the general level, you know? Because schools, in my opinion, are the places where the personal character is built, the very foundation of uh, human being is built. On uh, professional level, at the university levels, we just learn professions. So the Without that kind of foundation, without school reform, I think, which was addressed uh, partly by uh, panelists, there will be no, uh, no reason. I mean, we'll be basically putting uh, cart before the horse. So I think uh, I would like to hear, you know, uh, responses from Mr. Dwali and Zedani about it. Thank you. I have, I have very, very similar question to what Nick just asked. So. Um, Gladly listen to Mr. Dwal and Zidani on this. I think okay. that there is the much more sophisticated and much more uh, uh, interesting ways how to improve school uh, education rather than just abolishing army and moving all this budget to the education. Yeah, thanks. Th thanks very much for this question. It's, uh, indeed, it's an important question. I, I've heard this question many times. And I know that there is an opinion that unless you reform, you start from the reforming the school system, you cannot reform university system. And I think that this is a big misconception because it actually it's the other way around. The reason is that there are many reasons, but okay, we don't have time to discuss all of them. But for example, school system is much more ex extensive and much more general, okay? It's massive. So to reform school system, you need high quality teachers. 
to reform university system, you can start with high quality, you can concentrate your effort and build a high quality university system. Why? Because the university system, by definition, is sort of elite. And therefore, and without having good university system, you cannot train teachers. You see, teachers must be trained in academia. This is extremely important. You cannot substitute teacher training. Of course, trainings are very good. Nobody disputes that we have to reform school system. This has to be a parallel process. You have to have you have to introduce science in schools. By, by, for example, science museum would be one of the fantastic things to do that. I mean, very close interaction between science and, in general, uh, creativity, so all these creativity activities in schools. Nobody disputes that the, the salaries of teachers should go up, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, university is crucial because university, you need to create academic atmosphere. It's extremely hard to create academic atmosphere in schools without having very high academic atmosphere in universities, okay? So that's my, that would be my answer. Okay, um, well, I think um, it, it wouldn't be really fruitful to, th to look for the turtle on which everything rests, so to say, right? So because you cannot really find one foundation for everything. If you want to reform the education system, you should reform uh, both the school system and university system because you cannot really, I mean, even if, if you prepare teachers, then they should have the place to go and to kind of call teachers and to kind of uh, uh, find jobs. So basically, you need everything. I, I would, what I can, sorry? Yes, exactly, so, or uh, yes. Uh, or the, all, the, uh, all the turtles uh, down, uh, all the turtles down all the way, right? So basically, you cannot really find one base, one basis. Um, uh, Personally, I could say that um, uh, just a month ago we created education school at our university because, uh, because we understand that uh, the um, teacher education should be completely changed and uh, um, especially internationalization will be one way to do it, but there are others and m much more money especially state money should be put into this. Um, but I'm also sure that you cannot only start with one segment. If you really want changes, you should be, able, you should be ready to re reform bo uh, the, the, the system both on the school level and on the university level. I'll be the last one to deny the importance of university educations, obviously. But I don't think it will be enough just to start with it and see how everything else develops. But I completely agree with you, for example, on the question of a science museum. What we are doing for a couple of years now, we are doing not, not having science museum, we are doing science picnic. And I think it's crucial that uh, is a new generation receives this scientific worldview because if we don't have this, we will always be in pre-enlightenment situation in which prejudices determine our, uh, our perception of natural and social world. And this is a huge, um, a huge task also because enlightenment values and enlightenment ideology is no longer so popular around the world. I understand this very well. And it's a little bit paradoxical to go back to this tradition which seems to be so much questioned um, elsewhere. But I think this is also one of the um, a kind of a challenges for our postmodern world to defend some modern values because I think that uh, throwing them uh, away would be I don't know what will happen in other parts in more developed parts of the world but in, in our part of the world it will be just cat catastrophe so I think that uh, we definitely need to uh, think about some kind of new enlightenment as an idea and think about the institutions which would embody then this new enlightenment uh, which would give to the human beings the understanding they are agents which do not create, of course, history as, the, as their own will, but they still can um, affect something that their action matters, yes. Does anyone else want to make any final comments? No? Okay, oh, all right, please, okay. 
Just one phrase, not very serious. Uh, listening yesterday and today to our uh, fellow speakers, I had a feeling maybe we are already close to Plato's dream because we had a president philosopher, we have the rector's philosopher, so maybe they are already running the country. <laughs> so we will see because usually we are very skeptical, but maybe we should have some hopes. <laughs> well, actually, it started in the 90s already and it didn't get, have any effect, so that at that point I'll be very skeptical. <laughs> Okay, well, i just like to say that uh, the debates that you're having here are very familiar ones. I'd say in the United States, um, you know, th there's, a, there's a really big conflict, I think, between the demands of the general critical thinking, liberal humanistic education that's been traditional in many Western countries and these economic imperatives that uh, were discussed in the last panel yesterday where it's all math, science, technology. Uh, at Stanford, if you want a humanistic education, well, I, don't quote me on this, but I wouldn't go to Stanford. <laughs> that's, that's not the place you're gonna get. If you wanna be a computer scientist, make a lot of money in Silicon Valley, it's a great school to go to, but you know, for the kinds of uh, you know, values that, that you are speaking about, uh, it's not so great, and it's pretty hard to get a job if you have a humanistic education uh, without also being really good at statistics or engineering or something of that sort. So I think all of us have to confront some really uh, tough choices that are created, I think, by the imperatives of economic technological change uh, and what we regard as uh, you know, uh, requirements for shaping citizens. So I'd like to thank the panel and uh, thank the audience. And I guess we're off to lunch now. <laughs>